fuel slash air mixture curve. Add 32. High. Dry takeoff power. Fuel slash air mixture. Normal F slash A mixture auto rich position. F slash A mixture with water injection wet takeoff power. Low. Low airflow in LP slash HRI. Figure 1046. Fuel slash air curve for a water injection engine. Solely for cooling. A leaner mixture would give more power. Actually, water or, more accurately, the anti-detonant water slash alcohol mixture is a better coolant than extra fuel. Therefore, water injection permits higher manifold pressures, and a still further increase in power. In establishing the final curve for engine operation, the engine's ability to cool itself at various power settings is, of course, taken into account. Sometimes the mixture must be altered for a given installation, to compensate for the effect of cowl design, cooling airflow, or other factors on engine cooling. The final fuel slash air mixture curves take into account economy, power, engine cooling, idling characteristics, and all other factors that affect combustion. Figure 1047 shows a typical final curve for a flow type carburetor. Note that the fuel slash air mixture at idle is the same. Enrichment and manual lean. The mixture remains the same until the low cruise range is reached. At this point, the curves separate, and then remain parallel through the cruise and power ranges. Note the spread between the rich, and lean setting in the cruise range of both curves. Because of this spread, there is a decrease in power when the mixture control is moved from auto-rich to auto-lean with the engine operating in the cruise range. This is true, because the auto-rich setting in the cruise range is very near the best power mixture ratio. Therefore, any leaning out gives a mixture that is leaner than best power. Idle mixture. The idle mixture curve shows how the mixture changes when the idle mixture adjustment is changed. Figure 1048 note that the greatest effect is at idling speeds. However, there is some effect on the mixture at airflows above idling. The airflow at which the idle adjustment effect cancels out varies from minimum cruise to maximum cruise. The exact point depends on the type of carburetor and the carburetor setting. In general, the idle adjustment affects the fuel slash air mixture up to low cruise on engines equipped with flow type carburetors. This means that incorrect idle mixture adjustments can easily give faulty cruise performance, as well as poor idling. There are variations in mixture requirements between one engine and another, because of the fuel distribution within the engine, and the ability of the engine to cool. Remember, a carburetor setting must be rich enough, to supply a combustible mixture for the leanest cylinder. If fuel distribution is poor, the overall mixture must be richer, than would be required for the same engine, if distribution were good. The engine's ability to cool depends on such factors as cylinder design including the design of the cooling fins, rich, idle, line, maximum cruise, minimum cruise, rich, manual lean, takeoff, rich, idle, takeoff power, rated power, fuel slash air, minimum cruise, fuel slash air, maximum cruise, lean, low airflow in LP slash HRI, lean, low airflow in LP slash HRI, figure 1047, typical fuel air mixture curve for a flow type carburetor, figure 1048, idle mixture curve, 1033, compression ratio, accessories on the front of the engine, that cause individual cylinders to run hot, and the design of the baffling used to deflect airflow around the cylinder. At takeoff power, the mixture must be rich enough to supply sufficient fuel, to keep the hottest cylinder cool. Induction manifold. The induction manifold provides the means of distributing air, or the fuel slash air mixture, to the cylinders. Whether the manifold handles a fuel slash air mixture or air alone depends on the type of fuel metering system used. On an engine equipped with a carburetor, the induction manifold distributes a fuel slash air mixture from the carburetor to the cylinders. On the fuel injection engine, the fuel is delivered to injection nozzles, one in each cylinder, that provides the proper spray pattern for efficient burning. Thus, the mixing of fuel and air takes place at the inlet port to the cylinder. On the fuel injection engine, the induction manifold handles only air. The induction manifold is an important item, because of the effect it can have on the fuel slash air mixture, that finally reaches the cylinder. Fuel is introduced into the airstream by the carburetor in a liquid form. To become combustible, the fuel must be vaporized in the air. This vaporization takes place in the induction manifold, which includes the internal supercharger, if one is used. Any fuel that does not vaporize clings to the walls of the intake pipes. Obviously, this affects the effective fuel slash air ratio of the mixture, that finally reaches the cylinder in vapor form. This explains the reason for the apparently rich mixture required to start a cold engine. In a cold engine, some of the fuel in the airstream condenses out, and clings to the walls of the manifold. This is in addition to that fuel, that never vaporized in the first place. As the engine warms up, less fuel is required, because less fuel is condensed out of the airstream, and more of the fuel is vaporized, 
thus giving the cylinder the required fuel slash air mixture for normal combustion. Any leak in the induction system has an effect on the mixture reaching the cylinders. This is particularly true of a leak at the cylinder end of an intake pipe. At manifold pressures below atmospheric pressure, such a leak leans out the mixture. This occurs because additional air is drawn in from the atmosphere at the leaky point. The affected cylinder may overheat, fire intermittently, or even cut out altogether. Operational effect of valve clearance. While considering the operational effect of valve clearance, keep in mind that all aircraft reciprocating engines of current design use valve overlap. Valve overlap is when the intake and exhaust valves are open at the same time. This takes advantage of the momentum of the entering and exiting gases to improve the efficiency of getting fuel slash air in and exhaust gases out. Figure 1049 shows the pressures at the intake and manifold pressure, intake valve exhaust valve, impeller, map pressure differential barometric pressure, 35 hg, 6 hg, 29 hg, 20 hg, 9 hg, 29 hg, figure 1049, effect of valve overlap, exhaust ports under two different sets of operating conditions, in one case, the engine is operating at a manifold pressure of 35 hg, Barometric pressure exhaust back pressure is 29 hg. This gives a pressure acting in the direction indicated by the arrow of differential of 6 hg 3 side. During the valve overlap period, this pressure differential forces the fuel slash air mixture across the combustion chamber towards the open exhaust. This flow of fuel slash air mixture forces ahead of it the exhaust gases remaining in the cylinder, resulting in complete scavenging of the combustion chamber. This, in turn, permits complete filling of the cylinder with a fresh charge on the following intake event. This is the situation in which valve overlap gives increased power. There is a pressure differential in the opposite direction of 9 hg 4.5 side when the manifold pressure is below atmospheric pressure, for example, 20 hg. These cause air exhaust gases to be drawn into the cylinder through the exhaust port during valve overlap. In engines with collector rings, this inflow through the exhaust port at low power settings consists of burned exhaust gases. These gases are pulled back into the cylinder and mix with the incoming fuel slash air mixture. However, these exhaust gases are inert, they do not contain oxygen. Therefore, the fuel slash air mixture ratio is not affected much. With open exhaust stacks, the situation is entirely different. Here, fresh air containing oxygen is pulled into the cylinders through the exhaust. This leans out the mixture. Therefore, the carburetor. 1034. Bridge. Open stack. Fuel slash air mixture. Collector ring. Lean. Low idle air flow tape off high must be set to deliver an excessively rich idle mixture so that, when this mixture is combined with the fresh air drawn in through the exhaust port, the effective mixture in the cylinder will be at the desired ratio. At first thought, it does not appear possible that the effect of valve overlap on fuel slash air mixture is sufficient to cause concern. However, the effect of valve overlap becomes apparent when considering idle fuel air mixtures. These mixtures must be enriched 20 to 30 percent when open stacks, instead of collector rings radial engines are used on the same engine. Figure 1050 note the spread at idle between an open stack and an exhaust collector ring installation for engines that are otherwise identical. The mixture variation decreases as the engine speed or airflow is increased from idle into the cruise range. Engine, airplane, and equipment manufacturers provide a power plant installation that gives satisfactory performance. Cams are designed to give best valve operation and correct overlap. But valve operation is correct only if valve clearances are set and remain at the value recommended by the engine manufacturer. If valve clearances are set wrong, the valve overlap period is longer or shorter than the manufacturer intended. The same is true if clearances get out of adjustment during operation. Where there is too much valve clearance, the valves do not open as wide or remain open as long as they should. This reduces the overlap period. At idling speed, it affects the fuel slash air mixture since a less than normal amount of air or exhaust gases is drawn back into the cylinder during the shortened overlap period. As a result, the idle mixture tends to be too rich. When valve clearance is less than it should be, the valve overlap period is lengthened. A greater than normal amount of air, or exhaust gases, is drawn back into the cylinder at idling speeds. As a result, the idle mixture is leaned out at the cylinder. The carburetor is adjusted with the expectation that a certain amount of air or exhaust gases is drawn back into the cylinder at idling. If more or less air, or exhaust gases, are drawn into the cylinder during the valve overlap period, the mixture is too lean or too rich. When valve clearances are wrong, it is unlikely that they are all wrong in the same direction. Instead, there is too much clearance on some cylinders and too little on others. Naturally, this gives a variation in valve overlap between cylinders. This results in a variation in fuel slash air ratio at idling and lower power settings, since the carburetor delivers the same mixture to all cylinders. 
The carburetor cannot tailor the mixture to each cylinder to compensate for variation in valve overlap. The effect of variation in valve clearance and valve overlap on the fuel slash air mixture between cylinders is illustrated in figure 1051. Note how the cylinders with too little clearance run rich, and those with too much clearance run lean. Note also the extreme mixture variation between cylinders. Valve clearance also affects volumetric efficiency. Any variations in fuel slash air into and exhaust gases out of the cylinder affects the volumetric efficiency of the cylinder. With the use of hydraulic valve lifters that set the valve clearance automatically engine operation has been greatly improved. Hydraulic lifters do have a limited range in which they can control the valve clearance, or they can become stuck in one position that can cause them to be a source of engine trouble. Normally engines equipped with hydraulic lifters require little to no maintenance. Engine troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is a systematic analysis of the symptoms that indicate engine malfunction. It would be impractical to list all the malfunctions that could occur in a reciprocating engine, so only the most common malfunctions are discussed. A thorough knowledge of the engine systems, applied with logical reasoning, solves most problems that may occur. Figure 1052 lists general conditions or troubles that may be encountered on reciprocating engines, such as engine fails to start. They are further divided into the probable causes contributing to such conditions. Corrective actions are indicated in the remedy column. The items are presented with consideration given the frequency of occurrence, ease of accessibility, and complexity of the corrective action indicated. Figure 1050. Comparison of fuel slash air mixture curves for open stack and collector ring installations. 1035. Lengthened. Lean. Valve overlap is affected by valve clearance. Effect on fuel slash air mixture or combustible charge. Reduced. Rich. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Figure 1051. Effect of variation in valve overlap on fuel slash air mixture between cylinders. The need for troubleshooting normally is dictated by poor operation of the complete power plant. Power settings for the type of operation at which any difficulty is encountered, in many cases, indicate that part of the power plant that is the basic cause of difficulty. The cylinders of an engine, along with any type of supercharging, form an air pump. Furthermore, the power developed in the cylinders varies directly with the rate that air can be consumed by the engine. Therefore, a measure of air consumption or airflow into the engine is a measure of power input. Ignoring for the moment such factors as humidity and exhaust back pressure, the manifold pressure gauge and the engine tachometer provide a measure of engine air consumption. Thus, for a given RPM, any change in power input is reflected by a corresponding change in manifold pressure. The power output of an engine is the power absorbed by the propeller. Therefore, propeller load is a measure of power output. Propeller load, in turn, depends on the propeller RPM, blade angle, and air density. For a given angle and air density, propeller load power output is directly proportional to engine speed. The basic power of an engine is related to manifold pressure, fuel flow, and RPM. Because the RPM of the engine and the throttle opening directly control manifold pressure, the primary engine power controls are the throttle and the RPM control. An engine equipped with a fixed pitch propeller has only a throttle control. In this case, the throttle setting controls both manifold pressure and engine RPM. With proper precautions, manifold pressure can be taken as a measure of power input, and RPM can be taken as a measure of power output. However, the following factors must be considered. 1. Atmospheric pressure and air temperature must be considered, since they affect air density. 2. These measures of power input and power output should be used only for comparing the performance of an engine with its previous performance, or for comparing identical power plants. 3. With a controllable propeller, the blades must be against their low pitch stops, since this is the only blade position in which the blade angle is known, and does not vary. Once the blades are off their low pitch stops, the propeller governor takes over and maintains a constant RPM, regardless of power input or engine condition. This precaution means that the propeller control must be set to maximum or takeoff RPM, and the checks made at engine speeds below this setting. Having relative measures of power input and power output, the condition of an engine can be determined by comparing input and output. This is done by comparing the manifold pressure required to produce a given RPM with the manifold pressure required to produce the same RPM at a time when the engine or an identical power plant was known to be in top operating condition. 1036. Trouble probable causes remedy. Engine fails to start. Engine fails to idle properly. Low power and engine running uneven. Lack of fuel. Under priming over priming. Incorrect throttle setting defective spark plugs defective ignition wire defective or weak battery. Improper operation of magneto or breaker points. Water and carburetor internal failure magnetized impulse coupling, if installed. Frozen spark plug electrodes. Mixture control and idle cutoff. Shorted ignition switch or loose ground. Incorrect carburetor idle speed adjustment. Incorrect idle mixture. Leak in the induction system. 
low cylinder compression faulty ignition system, opener leaking primer, improper spark plug setting for altitude dirty air filter, mixture too rich, indicated by sluggish engine operation, red exhaust flame, and black smoke, mixture too lean, indicated by overheating or backfiring, leaks in induction system, defective spark plugs, improper grade of fuel, magneto breaker points not working properly, defective ignition wire, Defective spark plug terminal connectors. Incorrect valve clearance. Check fuel system for leaks fill fuel tank. Clean dirty lines, strainers, or fuel valves. Use correct priming procedure. Open throttle and unload engine by rotating the propeller. Open throttle to one tenth of its range. Clean and recap or replace spark plugs. Test and replace any defective wires. Replace with charged battery. Check internal timing of magnetos. Drain carburetor and fuel lines. Check oil sump strainer for metal particles. Magnetize impulse coupling. Replace spark plugs or dry out plugs. Open mixture control. Check and replacer obtain correct idle. Adjust throttle stop to obtain correct idle. Adjust mixture. Refer to engine manufacturer's handbook for proper procedure. Tighten all connections in the induction system. Replace any defective parts. Check cylinder compression. Check entire ignition system. Locker repair primer. Check spark plug gap. Cleaner replace. Check primer. Readjust carburetor mixture. Check fuel lines for dirt or other restrictions. Check fuel supply. Tighten all connections. Replace defective parts. Clean or replace spark plugs. Fill tank with recommended grade. Clean points. Check internal timing of magneto. Test and replace any defective wires. Replace connectors on spark plug wire. Adjust valve clearance. Check and replace a repair. Figure 1052. Troubleshooting opposed engines. An example shows the practical application of this method of determining engine condition. With the propeller control set for takeoff RPM full low blade angle, an engine may require 32 inches of manifold pressure to turn 2200 RPM for the ignition check. On previous checks, this engine required only 30 inches of manifold pressure to turn 2200 RPM at the same station altitude and under similar atmospheric conditions. Obviously, something is wrong, a higher power input manifold pressure is now required for the same power output RPM. There is a good chance that one cylinder has a malfunction. 1037. Trouble probable causes remedy. Low power and engine running uneven engine fails to develop full power. Rough running engine. Low oil pressure. High oil temperature. Excessive oil consumption. Restriction and exhaust system. Improper ignition timing. Throttle lever out of adjustment. Leak in induction system. Restriction and carburetor air scoop. Improper fuel. Propeller governor out of adjustment. Faulty ignition. Cracked engine mount S. Unbalanced propeller. Defective mounting bushings. Lead deposit on spark plugs. Primer unlocked. Insufficient oil. Dirty oil strainers. Defective pressure gauge. Air locker dirt and relief valve. Leak in suction line or pressure line. High oil temperature. Stoppage in oil pump intake passage. Warner score bearings. Insufficient air cooling. Insufficient oil supply. Clogged oil lines or strainers. Failing or failed bearings. Defective thermostats. Defective temperature gauge. Excessive blow by. Failing or failed bearing. Worn or broken piston rings. Incorrect installation of piston rings. External oil leakage. Leakage through engine fuel pump vent. Engine breather or vacuum pump breather. Remove restriction. Check magnetos for timing and synchronization. Adjust throttle lever. Tighten all connections and replace defective parts. Examine air scoop and remove restriction. Fill tank with recommended fuel. Adjust governor. Tighten all connections. Check system. Check ignition timing. Repair or replace engine mount S. Remove propeller and have it checked for balance. Install new mounting bushings. Clean or replace plugs. Lock primer. Check oil supply. Remove and clean oil strainers. Replace gauge. Remove and clean oil pressure relief valve. Check gasket between accessory housing crankcase. See high oil temperature and treble column. Check line for obstruction. Clean suction strainer. Overhaul engine. Check air inlet and outlet for deformation or obstruction. Fill oil tank to proper level. Remove and clean oil liner strainers. Examine sump for metal particles and, if found, overhaul engine. Replace thermostats. Usually caused by weaker stuck rings. Overhaul engine. Check sump for metal particles and if found, and an overhaul of engine is indicated. Install new rings. Install new rings. Check engine carefully for leaking gaskets or O-rings. Replace fuel pump seal. Check engine and overhaul or replace vacuum pump. Figure 1052. Troubleshooting opposed engines continued. 1038. There are several standards against which engine performance can be compared. The performance of a particular engine can be compared with its past performance, provided adequate records are kept. 
Engine performance can be compared with that of other engines on the same aircraft or aircraft having identical installations. If a fault does exist, it may be assumed that the trouble lies in one of the following systems. 1. Ignition system. 2. Fuel metering system. 3. Induction system. 4. Power section valves, cylinders, ec. 5. Instrumentation. If a logical approach to the problem is taken and the instrument readings properly utilized, a malfunctioning system can be pinpointed, and the specific problem in the defective system can be singled out. The more information available about any particular problem, the better the opportunity for a rapid repair. Information that is of value in locating a malfunction includes 1. Was any roughness noted? Under what conditions of operation? 2. What is the time on the engine and spark plugs? How long since last inspection? 3. Was the ignition system operational check and power check normal? 4. When did the trouble first appear? 5. Was backfiring or afterfiring present? 6. Was the full throttle performance normal? From a different point of view, the power plant is, in reality, a number of small engines turning a common crankshaft and being operated by two common phases, fuel metering and ignition. When backfiring, low power output, or other power plant difficulty is encountered, first find out which system, fuel metering or ignition, is involved and then determine whether the entire engine or only one cylinder is at fault. For example, backfiring normally is caused by 1. Valves holding open or sticking open in one or more of the cylinders. 2. Lean mixture. 3. Intake pipe leakage. 4. An error in valve adjustment that causes individual cylinders to receive too small a charge or one too large, even though the mixture to the cylinders has the same fuel slash air ratio. Ignition system reasons for backfiring might be a cracked distributor block or a high tension leak between two ignition leads. Either of these conditions could cause the charge in the cylinder to be ignited during the intake stroke. Ignition system troubles involving backfiring normally are not centered in the basic magneto, since a failure of the basic magneto would result in the engine not running, or it would run well at low speeds, but cut out at high speeds. On the other hand, replacement of the magneto would correct the difficulty caused by a cracked distributor where the distributor is a part of the magneto. If the fuel system, ignition system, and induction system are functioning properly, the engine should produce the correct BHP unless some fault exists in the basic power section. Valve flow pipe. Valve flow high is indicated by a hissing or whistle when pulling the propeller through prior to starting the engine, when turning the engine with the starter, or when running and blow by past the intake valve is audible through the carburetor. Correct valve flow by immediately to prevent valve failure and possible engine failure by taking the following steps. 1. Perform a cylinder compression test to locate the faulty cylinder. 2. Check the valve clearance on the affected cylinder. If the valve clearance is incorrect, the valve may be sticking in the valve guide. To release the sticking valve, place a fiber drift on the rocker arm immediately over the valve stem and strike the drift several times with a mallet. Sufficient hand pressure should be exerted on the fiber drift to remove any space between the rocker arm and the valve stem prior to hitting the drift. 3. If the valve is not sticking and the valve clearance is incorrect, adjust it as necessary. 4. Determine whether blow by has been eliminated by again pulling the engine through by hand or turning it with the starter. If blow by is still present, it may be necessary to replace the cylinder. 1039. Cylinder compression tests. The cylinder compression test determines if the valves, piston rings, and pistons are adequately sealing the combustion chamber. If pressure leakage is excessive, the cylinder cannot develop its full power. The purpose of testing cylinder compression is to determine whether cylinder replacement is necessary. The detection and replacement of defective cylinders prevents a complete engine change because of cylinder failure. It is essential that cylinder compression tests be made periodically. Low compression, for the most part, can be traced to leaky valves. Conditions that affect engine compression are 1. Incorrect valve clearances 2. Worn, scuffed, or damaged piston 3. Excessive wear of piston rings and cylinder walls 4. Burnt or warped valves 5. Carbon particles between the face and the seat of the valve or valves 6. Earlier late valve timing Perform a compression test as soon as possible after the engine is shut down, so that piston rings, cylinder walls, and other parts are still freshly lubricated. However, it is not necessary to operate the engine prior to accomplishing compression checks during engine buildup or on individually replaced cylinders. In such cases, before making the test, spray a small quantity of lubricating oil into the cylinder S, and turn the engine over several times to seal the piston and rings in the cylinder barrel. Be sure that the ignition switch is in the off position, so that there is no accidental firing of the engine. Remove necessary cowling and the most accessible spark plug from each cylinder. When removing the spark plugs, identify them to coincide with the cylinder. Close examination of the plugs aid in diagnosing problems within the cylinder. 
review the maintenance records of the engine being tested. Records of previous compression checks help in determining progressive wear conditions and in establishing the necessary maintenance actions. Differential Pressure Tester The differential pressure tester checks the compression of aircraft engines by measuring the leakage through the cylinders. The design of this compression tester is such that minute valve leakages can be detected, making possible the replacement of cylinders where valve burning is starting. The operation of the compression tester is based on the principle that, for any given airflow through a fixed orifice, a constant pressure drop across the orifice results. As the airflow and pressure changes, pressure varies accordingly in the same direction. If air is supplied under pressure to the cylinder with both intake and exhaust valves closed, the amount of air that leaks by the valves or piston rings indicates their condition, the perfect cylinder would have no leakage. The differential pressure tester requires the application of air pressure to the cylinder, being tested with the piston atop center compression stroke. Figure 1053. Guidelines for performing a differential compression test are 1. Perform the compression test as soon as possible after engine shutdown to provide uniform lubrication of cylinder walls and rings. 2. Remove the most accessible spark plug from the cylinder, or cylinders, and install a spark plug adapter in the spark plug insert. 3. Connect the compression tester assembly to a 100 to 150 psi compressed air supply. Figure 1054 with the shutoff valve on the compression tester closed. Regulated pressure gauge shutoff valve. Cylinder pressure gauge. 25. 20. 15. 30. 35. 40. 45. 25. 20. 15. 30, 35, 40, 45, 10, 50, 55, 60, 70, 65, 10, 75, 75, 50, 55, 60, 70, 65, meter amorphous, the air compressor, piston on true top dead center, figure 1053, differential compression tester diagrams, figure 1054, compression tester and adapter, 1040, Adjust the regulator of the regulated pressure gauge compression tester to obtain 80 psi. 4. Open the shutoff valve and attach the air hose quick connect fitting to the spark plug adapter. The shutoff valve, when open, automatically maintains a pressure in the cylinder of 15 to 20 psi when both the intake and exhaust valves are closed. 5. By hand, turn the engine over in the direction of rotation until the piston in the cylinder being tested comes up on the compression stroke against the 15 psi. Continue turning the propeller slowly in the direction of rotation until the piston reaches top dead center. Top dead center can be detected by a decrease in force required to move the propeller. If the engine is rotated past top dead center, the 15 to 20 psi tends to move the propeller in the direction of rotation. If this occurs, back the propeller up at least one plate prior to turning the propeller again in the direction of rotation. This backing up is necessary to eliminate the effect of backlash in the valve operating mechanism and to keep the piston ring seated on the lower ring lands. 6. Close the shutoff valve in the compression tester and recheck the regulated pressure to see that it is 80 psi with air flowing into the cylinder. If the regulated pressure is more or less than 80 psi, readjust the regulator in the test unit to obtain 80 psi. When closing the shutoff valve, make sure that the propeller path is clear of all objects. There is sufficient air pressure in the combustion chamber to rotate the propeller if the piston is not on top dead center. 7. With regulated pressure adjusted to 80 psi, if the cylinder pressure reading indicated on the cylinder pressure gauge is below the minimum specified for the engine being tested, move the propeller in the direction of rotation to seat the piston rings in the cruise. Check all the cylinders and record the readings. If low compression is obtained on any cylinder, turn the engine through with the starter or restart and run the engine to take off power and reject the cylinder or cylinders having low compression. If the low compression is not corrected, remove the rocker box cover and check the valve clearance to determine if the difficulty is caused by inadequate valve clearance. If the low compression is not caused by inadequate valve clearance, place a fiber drift on the rocker arm immediately over the valve stem and tap the drift several times with a 1 to 2 pound hammer to dislodge any foreign material that may be lodged between the valve and valve seat. After staking the valve in this manner, rotate the engine with the starter and reject the compression. Do not make a compression check after staking a valve until the crankshaft has been rotated either with the starter or by hand to reseat the valve in normal manner. The higher seating velocity obtained when staking the valve will indicate valve seating, even though valve seats are slightly extra eccentric. This procedure should only be performed if approved by the manufacturer. Cylinders having compression below the minimum specified should be further checked to determine whether leakage is past the exhaust valve, intake valve, or piston. Excessive leakage can be detected during the compression check. 1. At the exhaust valve, by listening for air leakage at the exhaust outlet. 2. At the intake valve, by escaping air at the air intake. And 3. Past the piston rings, by escaping air at the engine breather outlets.
Next to valve blow-by, the most frequent cause of compression leakage is excessive leakage past the piston. This leakage may occur because of lack of oil. To check this possibility, apply engine oil into the cylinder and around the piston. Then, recheck the compression. If this procedure raises compression to or above the minimum required, continue the cylinder in service. If the cylinder pressure readings still do not meet the minimum requirement, replace the cylinder. When it is necessary to replace a cylinder as a result of low compression, record the cylinder number and the compression value of the newly installed cylinder on the compression check sheet. Cylinder replacement. Reciprocating engine cylinders are designed to operate for a specified time before normal wear requires their overhaul. If the engine is operated as recommended, and proficient maintenance is performed, the cylinders normally last until the engine has reached its TPO. It is known from experience that materials fail, and engines are abused through incorrect operation. This has a serious effect on cylinder life. Another reason for premature cylinder change is poor maintenance. Therefore, exert special care to ensure that all the correct maintenance procedures are adhered to when working on the engine. Some of the reasons for cylinder replacement are 1. Low compression 2. High oil consumption in one or more cylinders 3. Excessive valve guide clearance 1041 4. Loose intake pipe flanges 5. Looser defective spark plug inserts 6. External damage, such as cracks The cylinder is always replaced as a complete assembly, which includes piston, rings, valves, and valve springs. Obtain the cylinder by ordering the cylinder assembly under the part number specified in the engine parts catalog. Parts, such as valve springs, rocker arms, and rocker box covers, may be replaced individually. Normally, all the cylinders in an engine are similar, all are standard size or all a certain oversize, and all are steel bore or all are chrome plated. The size of the cylinder is indicated by a color code around the barrel between the attaching flange and the lower barrel cooling fin. In some instances, air-cooled engines are equipped with chrome plated cylinders. Chrome plated cylinders are usually identified by a paint band around the barrel between the attaching flange and the lower barrel cooling fin. This color band is usually international orange. When installing a chrome plated cylinder, do not use chrome plated piston rings. The matched assembly includes the correct piston rings. However, if a piston ring is broken during cylinder installation, check the cylinder marking to determine what ring, chrome plated or otherwise, is correct for replacement. Similar precautions must be taken to be sure that the correct size rings are installed. Correct procedures and care are important when replacing cylinders. Careless work or the use of incorrect tools can damage the replacement cylinder or its parts. Incorrect procedures in installing rocker box covers may result in troublesome oil leaks. Improper torque on cylinder hold down nuts or cap screws can easily result in a cylinder malfunction and subsequent engine failure. Cylinder removal. Since these instructions are meant to cover all air-cooled engines, they are of a very general nature. The applicable manufacturer's maintenance manual should be consulted for torque values and special precautions applying to a particular aircraft and engine. However, always practice neatness and cleanliness, and always protect openings so that nuts, washers, tools, and miscellaneous items do not enter the engine's internal sections. Assuming that all obstructing cowling and brackets have been removed, first remove the intake pipe and exhaust pipes. Plug or cover openings in the intake or diffuser section. Then, remove cylinder deflectors and any attaching brackets that would obstruct cylinder removal. Loosen the spark plugs. And remove the spark plug lead clamps. Do not remove the spark plugs until ready to pull the cylinder off. Remove the rocker box covers. First, remove the nuts, and then tap the cover lightly with a rawhide mallet or plastic hammer. Never pry the cover off with a screwdriver or similar tool. Loosen the pushrod packing gland nuts or hose clamps, top and bottom. Push rods are removed by depressing the rocker arms with a special tool, or by removing the rocker arm. Before removing the push rods, turn the crankshaft until the piston is a top dead center on the compression stroke. This relieves the pressure on both intake and exhaust rocker arms. It is also wise to back off the adjusting nut as far as possible, because this allows maximum clearance for push rod removal when the rocker arms are depressed. On some model engines, or if the engine is rotated, tappets and springs of lower cylinders can fall out. Provision must be made to catch them as the push rod and housing are removed. After removing the push rods, examine them for markings, or mark them, so that they may be replaced in the same location as they were before removal. The ball ends are usually worn to fit the sockets in which they have been operating. Furthermore, on some engines, push rods are not all of the same length. A good procedure is to mark the push rods near the valve tap and ends. No. 1 in, no. 1 x, no. 2 in, no. 2 x, ek. On fuel injection engines, disconnect the fuel injection line and any line clamps that interfere with cylinder removal. The next step in removing the cylinder is to cut the lock wire or remove the cotter pin, and pry off the locking device from the cylinder attaching cap screws or nuts. Remove all the screws or nuts except two located 180 degrees apart. 
Use the wrench specified for this purpose in the special tool section of the applicable manual. Finally, while supporting the cylinder, remove the two remaining nuts and gently pull the cylinder away from the crankcase. Two technicians working together during this step, as well as during the remaining procedure for cylinder replacement, helps prevent damage or dropping of the cylinder. After the cylinder skirt has cleared the crankcase, but before the piston protrudes from the skirt, provide some means usually a shop cloth for preventing pieces of broken rings from falling into the crankcase. After the piston has been removed, remove the cloths and carefully check that all pieces were prevented from falling into the crankcase. Place a support on the cylinder mounting pad, and secure it with two capped screws or nuts. Then, remove the piston and ring assembly from the connecting rod. A pin pusher or puller tool can be used when varnish makes it hard to remove the pin. If the special tool is not available, and the drift is used to. 1042. Remove the piston pin, the connecting rod should be supported, so that it does not have to take the shock of the blows. If this is not done, the rod may be damaged. After the removal of a cylinder and piston, the connecting rod must be supported to prevent damage to the rod and crankcase. This can be done by supporting each connecting rod with the removed cylinder base oil seal ring looped around the rod and cylinder base studs. Using a wire brush, clean the studs or capped screws and examine them for cracks, damaged threads, or any other visible defects. If one capped screw is found loose or broken at the time of cylinder removal, all the capped screws for the cylinder should be discarded, since the remaining capped screws may have been seriously weakened. A cylinder hold down stud failure places the adjacent studs under a greater operating pressure, and they are likely to be stretched beyond their elastic limit. The engine manufacturer's instruction must be followed for the number of studs that have to be replaced after a stud failure. When removing a broken stud, take proper precautions to prevent metal chips from entering the engine crankcase section. In all cases, both faces of the washers and the seating faces of stud nuts or capped screws must be cleaned, and any roughness or burrs removed. Cylinder installation. See that all preservative oil accumulation on the cylinder and piston assembly is washed off with solvent and thoroughly dried with compressed air. Install the piston and ring assembly on the connecting rod. Be sure that the piston faces in the right direction. The piston number stamped on the bottom of the piston head should face toward the front of the engine. Lubricate the piston pin before inserting it. It should fit with a push fit. If a drift must be used, follow the same precaution that was taken during pin removal. Oil the exterior of the piston assembly generously, forcing oil around the piston rings and in the space between the rings and grooves. Stagger the ring gaps around the piston and check to see that the rings are in the correct grooves and whether they are positioned correctly, as some are used as oil scrapers, others as pumper rings. The number, type, and arrangement of the compression and oil control rings vary with the make and model of engine. Perform any and all visual, structural, and dimensional inspection checks before installing the cylinder. Check the flange to see that the mating surface is smooth and clean. Coat the inside of the cylinder barrel generously with oil. Be sure that the cylinder oil seal ring is in place and that only one seal ring is used. Using a ring compressor, compress the rings to a diameter equal to that of the piston. With the piston at TDC, start the cylinder assembly down over the piston, making certain that the cylinder and piston plane remain the same. Ease the cylinder over the piston with a straight, even movement that moves the ring compressor as the cylinder slips on. Do not rock the cylinder while slipping it on the piston, since any rocking is apt to release a piston ring or a part of a ring from the ring compressor prior to the ring's entrance into the cylinder bore. A ring released in this manner expands and prevents the piston from entering the cylinder. Any attempt to force the cylinder onto the piston is apt to cause cracking or chipping of the ring or damage to the ring lands. After the cylinder has slipped on the piston, so that all piston rings are in the cylinder bore, remove the ring compressor and the connecting rod guide. Then, slide the cylinder into place on the mounting pad. If capped screws are used, rotate the cylinder to align the holes. While still supporting the cylinder, install two capped screws or stud nuts 180 degrees apart. Install the remaining nuts or capped screws and tighten them until they are snug. The hold down nuts, or capped screws, must now be torqued to the values specified in the table of torque values in the engine manufacturer service or overhaul manual. Apply the torque with a slow, steady motion until the prescribed value is reached. Hold the tension on the wrench for a sufficient length of time to ensure that the nut or cap screw tightens no more at the prescribed torque value. In many cases, additional turning of the cap screw, or nut, as much as one quarter turn can be done by maintaining the prescribed torque on the nut for a short period of time. After the stud nuts, or cap screws, have been torqued to the prescribed value, safety them in the manner recommended in the engine manufacturer service manual. Reinstall the push rods, push rod housings, rocker arms, barrel deflectors, intake pipes, ignition harness lead clamps and brackets, fuel injection line clamps and fuel injection nozzles if removed, exhaust stack, cylinder head deflectors, and spark plugs. Remember that the push rods must be installed in their original locations and must not be turned end to end. 
make sure that the push rod ball end seats properly in the tappet. If it rests on the edge or shoulder of the tappet during valve clearance adjustment and later drops into place, valve clearance is off. Furthermore, rotating the crankshaft with the push rod resting on the edge of the tappet may bend the push rod. After installing the push rods and rocker arms, set the valve clearance. Before installing the rocker box covers, lubricate the rocker arm bearings and valve stems. Check the rocker. 1043. Box covers for flatness, resurface them if necessary. After installing the gaskets and covers, tighten the rocker box cover nuts to the specified torque. Always follow the recommended safety procedures. Cold cylinder check. The cold cylinder check determines the operating characteristics of each cylinder of an air-cooled engine. The tendency for any cylinder, or cylinders, to be cold, or to be only slightly warm, indicates lack of combustion or incomplete combustion within the cylinder. This must be corrected, if best operation and power conditions are to be obtained. The cold cylinder check is made with a cold cylinder indicator. Engine difficulties that can be analyzed by use of the cold cylinder indicator are figure 1055. 1. Rough engine operation. 2. Excessive RPM drop during the ignition system check. 3. High manifold pressure for a given engine RPM during the ground check when the propeller is in the full low pitch position. 4. Faulty mixture ratios caused by improper valve clearance. In preparation for the cold cylinder check, head the aircraft into the wind to minimize irregular cooling of the individual cylinders and to ensure even propeller loading during engine operation. Operate the engine on its roughest magneto at a speed between 1200 and 1600 RPM until the cylinder head temperature reading is stabilized. If engine roughness is encountered at more than one speed, or if there is an indication that a cylinder ceases operating at idle or higher speeds, run the engine at each of these speeds, and perform a cold cylinder check to pick out all the dead or intermittently operating cylinders. When low power output or engine vibration is encountered at speeds above 1600 RPM when operating with the ignition switch on both, run the engine at the speed where the difficulty is encountered until the cylinder head temperatures have stabilized. When cylinder head temperatures have reached the stabilized values, stop the engine by moving the mixture control to the idle cutoff or full lean position. When the engine ceases firing, turn off both ignition and master switches. Record the cylinder head temperature reading registered on the flight deck gauge. As soon as the propeller has ceased rotating, apply the instrument to each cylinder head, and record the relative temperature of each cylinder. Start with number 1. 100. 200. 300. 0. 5. 4. Oil. Figure 1055, cold cylinder indicator, and proceed in numerical order around the engine, as rapidly as possible. To obtain comparative temperature values, a firm contact must be made at the same relative location on each cylinder. Note any outstandingly low cold values. Compare the temperature readings to determine which cylinders are dead cold cylinders, or are operating intermittently. Difficulties that may cause a cylinder to be an operative dead, when isolated to one magneto, either the right or left positions, are 1 defective spark plugs 2. incorrect valve clearances 3. leaking intake pipes 4. lack of compression 5. defective spark plug lead 6. defective fuel injection nozzle 1044. cylinder no right magneto temperature readings left magneto repeat the cold cylinder test for the other magneto positions on the ignition switch if necessary cooling the engine between tests is unnecessary the airflow created by the propeller and the cooling effect of the incoming fuel slash air mixture is sufficient to cool any cylinders that are functioning on one test and not functioning on the next. In interpreting the results of a cold cylinder check, remember that the temperatures are relative. A cylinder temperature taken alone means little, but when compared with the temperatures of other cylinders on the same engine, it provides valuable diagnostic information. The readings shown in figure 1056 illustrate this point. On this check, the cylinder head temperature gauge reading at the time the engine was shut down was 160 degrees C on both tests. A review of these temperature readings reveals that, on the right magneto, cylinder number 3 runs cool and cylinders 5 and 6 run cold. This indicates that cylinder 3 is firing intermittently, and cylinders 5 and 6 are dead during engine operation on the plugs fired by the right magneto. Cylinders 4 and 6 are dead during operation on the plugs fired by the left magneto. Cylinder 6 is completely dead. An ignition system operational check would not disclose this dead cylinder, since the cylinder is inoperative on both right and left switch positions. A dead cylinder can be detected during run-up, since an engine with a dead cylinder requires a higher than normal manifold pressure to produce any given RPM below the cut and speed of the propeller governor. A dead cylinder could also be detected by comparing power input and power output with the aid of a torque meter. Defects within the ignition system that can cause a cylinder to go completely dead are 1. Both spark plugs inoperative. 2. Both ignition leads grounded, leaking, or open. 
3. A combination of inoperative spark plugs and defective ignition leads. 4. Faulty fuel injection nozzles, incorrect valve clearances, and other defects outside the ignition system. In interpreting the readings obtained on the cold cylinder check, the amount the engine cools during the check must be considered. To determine the extent to which this factor should be considered in evaluating the readings, recheck some of the first cylinders tested, and compare the final readings with those made at the start of the check. Another factor to be considered, is the normal variation in temperature between cylinders and between rows. This variation results from those design features that affect the airflow past the cylinders. Turbine engine maintenance. Turbine power plant maintenance procedures vary widely according to the design and construction of the particular engine being serviced. The detailed procedures recommended by the engine manufacturer should be followed when performing inspections or maintenance. Maintenance information presented in this section is not intended to specify the exact manner in which maintenance operations are to be performed, but is included to convey a general idea of the procedures involved. For inspection purpose, the turbine engine is divided into two main sections, the cold and hot compressor section. Maintenance of the compressor, or cold section, is one of concern, because damage to plates can cause engine failure. Much of the damage to the plates arises from foreign matter being drawn into the turbine engine air intakes. The atmosphere near the ground is filled with tiny particles of dirt, oil, soot, and other foreign matter. A large volume of air is introduced into the compressor, and centrifugal force throws the dirt particles outward, so that they build up to form a coating on the casing, the vanes, and the compressor plates. Accumulation of dirt on the compressor plates reduces the aerodynamic efficiency of the plates with resultant deterioration in engine performance. The efficiency of the plates is impaired by dirt deposits in a manner similar to that of an aircraft wing under icing conditions. Unsatisfactory acceleration and high exhaust gas temperature can result from foreign deposits on compressor components. An end result of foreign particles, if allowed to accumulate in sufficient quantity, would be inefficiency. The condition can be remedied by periodic inspection, cleaning, and repair of compressor components. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 180, 170, 100, 145, 70, 60, 170, 175, 170, 60, 155, 45, figure 1056, readings taken during the cold cylinder check, 1045, inspection and cleaning, Minor damage to axial flow engine compressor plates may be repaired if the damage can be removed without exceeding the allowable limits established by the manufacturer. Typical compressor blade repair limits are shown in figure 1057. Well-rounded damage to leading and trailing edges that is evident on the opposite side of the blade is usually acceptable without rework, provided the damage is in the outer half of the blade only, and the indentation does not exceed values specified in the engine manufacturer's service and overhaul instruction manuals. When working on the inner half of the blade, damage must be treated with extreme caution. Repaired compressor blades are inspected by either magnetic particle or fluorescent penetrant inspection methods to ensure that all traces of the damage have been removed. All repairs must be well blended, so that surfaces are smooth. Figure 1058 No cracks of any extent are tolerated in any area. Whenever possible, stoning and local rework of the blade should be performed parallel to the length of the blade. Rework must be accomplished by hand, using stones, files, or emery cloth. Do not use a power tool to buff the entire area of the blade. The surface finish in the repaired area must be comparable to that of a new blade. On centrifugal flow engines, it is difficult to inspect the compressor inducers without first removing the air inlet screen. After removing the screen, clean the compressor inducer and inspect it with a strong light. Check each vein for cracks by slowly turning the compressor. Look for cracks in the leading edges. A crack is usually cause for component rejection. The compressor inducers are normally the parts that are damaged by the impingement of foreign material during engine operation. Compressor inducers are repaired by stoning out and blending the nicks and densing the critical band 112 to 212 inches. Maximum allowable repair limits inches. Steel plates, titanium blades, stages, stages 1 through 4, 5 through 9, 1 through 4, 5 through 9. Area C. Blade area. A PCDE. R radius D depth. 5 slash 16 R1 slash 32 D 5 slash 32 D point 008 D 1 slash 32 D 1 slash 4 R1 slash 32 D 1 slash 8 D point 005 D 1 slash 32 D 5 slash 16 R1 slash 32 D 5 slash 32 D none 1 slash 32 D 1 slash 4 R1 slash 32 D 1 slash 8 D none 1 slash 32 D Area A Radius Area C Area C Area C Area E These dimensions controlled by depth limit Area B Area C Caution. 
The limits referred to in this video and areas and pertain to local, isolated, damaged areas only must not be interpreted as authority for removal of material all across the tip, and leading or trailing edges as might be done in a single machine and cut. Area B. Concave and convex surface. Approximate center line. Area B. Concave and convex surface. Area E. Area E. These dimensions controlled by depth limit. Area B. 1 fourth 1 fourth. Area D. Fillet area. Area E. Figure 1057. Typical compressor blade repair limits. 1046. Damaged blade damaged blade after blending damaged blade damaged blade after blending. Figure 1058. Examples of repairs to damaged blades. From the outside edge, if the depth of such nicks or dents does not exceed that specified in the engine manufacturer's service or overhaul instruction manuals. Repair nicks by stoning out material beyond the depth of damage to remove the resulting cold work metal. A generous radius must be applied at the edges of the blend. After blending the nick, it should be smoothed over with a crocus cloth. Hitting nicks or corrosion found on the sides of the inducer veins are similarly removed by blending. Causes of blade damage. Loose objects often enter an engine either accidentally or through carelessness. Foreign object damage spots, such as pencils, tools, and flashlights, are often drawn into the engine and can cause damage to the fan blades. Figure 1059 do not carry any objects in pockets when working around operational turbine engines. Figure 1059. Fan blade damage. A compressor rotor can be damaged beyond repair by tools that are left in the air intake, where they are drawn into the engine on subsequent starts. A simple solution to the problem is to check the tools against the tool checklist. Prior to starting a turbine engine, make a minute inspection of engine inlet ducts to assure that items, such as nuts, bolts, lock wire, or tools, were not left there after work had been performed. Figure 1060 shows some examples of blade damage to an axial flow engine. The descriptions and possible causes of blade damage are given in Figure 1061. Corrosion pitting is not considered serious on the compressor stator veins of axial flow engines if the pitting is within the allowed tolerance. Do not attempt to repair any vein by straightening, brazing, welding, or soldering. Focus cloth, fine files, and stones are used to blend out damage by removing a minimum of material and leaving a surface finish comparable to that of a new part. The purpose of this blending is to minimize stresses that concentrate the dents, scratches, or cracks. The inspection and repair of air intake guide veins, swirl veins, and screens on centrifugal flow engines necessitates the use of a strong light. Inspect screen assemblies for brakes, trips, or holes. Screens may be thin dipped to tighten the wire mesh, provided the wires are not worn too thin. If the frame strip or lugs have separated from the screen frames, rebrazing may be necessary. Inspect the guide and swirl veins for looseness. Inspect the outer edges of the guide veins, paying particular attention to the point of contact between the guides and swirl veins for cracks and dents due to the impingement of foreign particles. 1047. Dent. Store cracks. Erosion pudding. Hauling. Damage repair blend. Burn. Scratches. Burr. Figure 1060. Compressor blade damage. Term appearance usual causes. Blend. Pile burning. Burr corrosion pits cracks. Dent gall gouging. Growth. Hit profile store scratch. Smooth repair of ragged edge or surface into the contour of surrounding area. Bent blade. Damage to surfaces evidenced by discoloration or, in severe cases, by flow of material. A ragged or turned out edge. Breakdown of the surface. Pitted appearance. A partial fracture separation. Small, smoothly rounded hollow. A transfer of metal from one surface to another. Displacement of material from a surface. A cutting or tearing effect. Leagation of blade. See corrosion. Contour of a blade or surface. Deep scratches. Narrow shallow marks. Foreign objects. Excessive heat. Grinding or cutting operation. Corrosive agents moisture. Heck. Excessive stress due to shock, overloading, or faulty processing. Defective materials. Overheating. Striking of a part with a dull object. Severe rubbing. Presence of a comparatively large foreign body between moving parts. Continued and slasher excessive heat and centrifugal force. Presence of chips between surfaces. Sand or fine foreign particles. Careless handling. Figure 1061. Blade maintenance terms. 1048. Inspect the edges of the swirl veins. Inspect the downstream edge of the guide veins very closely, because cracks are generally more prevalent in this area. Cracks that branch or fork out so that a piece of metal could break free and fall into the compressor are cause for vein rejection. Blending and replacement. Because of the thin sheet construction of hollow veins, blending on the concave and convex surfaces, including the leading edge, is limited. Small, shallow dents are acceptable if the damage is of a rounded or gradual contour type and not a sharper V-type and if no cracking or tearing of vein material is evident in the damaged area. Trailing edge damage may be blended if one-third of the weld seam remains after repair. 
Figure 1062 concave surfaces of rubber filled veins may have allowable cracks extending inward from the outer airfoil, provided there is no suggestion of pieces breaking away. Using a lighted mirror, inspect each guide vein trailing edge and vein body for cracks or damage caused by foreign objects. Any inspection and repair of turbine compressor section components require that the technician always use the specific manufacturer's current information for evaluation and limits of repairs. Combustion Section Inspection One of the controlling factors in the service life of the turbine engine is the inspection and cleaning of the hot section. Emphasis must be placed on the importance of careful inspection and repair of this section. The following are general procedures for performing a hot section turbine and combustion section inspection. It is not intended to imply that these procedures are to be followed when performing repairs or inspections on turbine engines. However, the various practices are typical of those used on many turbine engines. Where a clearance or tolerance is shown, it is for illustrative purposes only. Always follow the instructions contained in the applicable manufacturer's maintenance and overhaul manuals. The entire external combustion case should be inspected for evidence of hot spots, exhaust leaks, and distortions before the case is opened. After the combustion case has been opened, the combustion chambers can be inspected for localized overheating, cracks, or excessive wear. Figure 1063 inspect the first stage turbine blades and nozzle guide vanes for cracks, warping, or fog. Also inspect the combustion chamber outlet ducts and turbine nozzle for cracks, and for evidence of fog. Before blending. After blending. Figure 1062. Guide vane trailing edge damage. One of the most frequent discrepancies that are detected while inspecting the hot section of a turbine engine is cracking. These cracks may occur in many forms, and the only way to determine that they are within acceptable limits, or if they are allowed at all, is to refer to the applicable engine manufacturer's service and overhaul manuals. 1049. Figure 1063. Combustion case inspection. Cleaning the hot section is not usually necessary for a repair in the field, but in areas of high salt water or other chemicals a turbine rinse should be accomplished. Engine parts can be degressed by using the emulsion type cleaners or chlorinated solvents. The emulsion type cleaners are safe for all metals, since they are neutral and non-corrosive. Cleaning parts by the chlorinated solvent method leaves the parts absolutely dry. If they are not to be subjected to further cleaning operations, they should be sprayed with a corrosion preventive solution to protect them against rust or corrosion. The hot section, which generally includes the combustion section and turbine sections, normally require inspections at regular intervals. The extent of disassembly of the engine to accomplish this inspection varies from different engine types. Most engines require that the combustion case be open for the inspection of the hot section. However, in performing this disassembly, numerous associated parts are readily accessible for inspection. The importance of properly supporting the engine and the parts being removed cannot be overstressed. The alignment of components being removed and installed is also of the utmost importance. After all the inspections and repairs are made, the manufacturer's detailed assembly instructions should be followed. These instructions are important in efficient engine maintenance and the ultimate life and performance of the engine. Extreme care must be taken during assembly to prevent dirt, dust, hotter pins, lock wire, nuts, washers, or other foreign material from entering the engine. Marking materials for combustion section parts. Certain materials may be used for temporary marking during assembly and disassembly. Always refer to manufacturer's information for marking parts. Layout dye lightly applied or chalk may be used to mark parts that are directly exposed to the engine's gas path, such as turbine blades and discs, turbine, vanes, and combustion chamber liners. A wax marking pencil may be used for parts that are not directly exposed to the gas path. Do not use a wax marking pencil on the liner surface or a turbine rotor. The use of carbon alloy or metallic pencils is not recommended because of the possibility of causing intergranular corrosion attack that could result in a reduction in material strength and cracking. Inspection and repair of combustion chambers. Inspect the combustion chambers and covers for cracks by using visible dye or fluorescent penetrant inspection method. Any cracks, hits, or dents are usually caused for rejecting the component. Inspect the covers, noting particularly the area around the fuel drain bosses for any pits or corrosion. When repairing the combustion chamber liner, the procedures given in the appropriate engine manufacturer's overhaul instruction manual should be followed. If there is doubt that the liner is serviceable, it should be replaced. Combustion chambers should be replaced or repaired if two cracks are progressing from a free edge so that their meeting is imminent and could allow a piece of metal that could cause turbine damage to break loose. Separate cracks in the baffle are acceptable. Cracks in the cone are rare but, at any location on this component, is cause for rejection of the liner. Cracks in the swirl veins are cause for rejection of the liner. Loose swirl veins may be repaired by silver brazing. Cracks in the front liner emanating from the air holes are acceptable, provided they do not exceed allowable limits. 
If such cracks fork or link with others, the liner must be repaired. If two cracks originating from the same air hole are diametrically opposite, the liner is acceptable. Radial cracks extending from the interconnector and spark igniter pause are acceptable, if they do not exceed allowable limits, and if such cracks do not fork or link with others. Circumferential cracks around the pause pad should be repaired prior to reuse of the liner. Baffle cracks connecting more than two holes should be repaired. After long periods of engine operation, the external surfaces of the combustion chamber liner location pads often show signs of fretting. This is acceptable, provided no resultant cracks or perforation of the metal is apparent. Any cover or chamber inadvertently dropped on the hard surface or mishandled should be thoroughly inspected for minute cracks that may elongate over a period of time and then open, creating a hazard. Parts may be found where localized areas have been heated to an extent to buckle small portions of the chamber. Such parts are considered acceptable if the burning of the part has not progressed into an adjacent welded area or to such. 1050. An extent is to weaken the structure of the liner weldment. Buckling of the combustion chamber liner can be corrected by straightening the liner. Moderate buckling and associated cracks are acceptable in the row of cooling poles. More severe buckling that produces a pronounced shortening or tilting of the liner is cause for rejection. Upon completion of the repairs by welding, the liner should be restored as closely as possible to its original shape. Fuel nozzle and support assemblies. Clean all carbon deposits from the nozzles by washing with a cleaning fluid approved by the engine manufacturer and remove the softened deposits with a soft bristle brush. It is desirable to have filtered air passing through the nozzle during the cleaning operation to carry away deposits as they are loosened. Make sure all parts are clean. Dry the assemblies with clean, filtered air. Because the spray characteristics of the nozzle may become impaired, no attempt should be made to clean the nozzles by scraping with a hard implement or by rubbing with a wire brush. Inspect each component part of the fuel nozzle assembly for nicks and burrs. Many fuel nozzles can be checked by flowing fluid through the nozzle under pressure and closely checking the flow pattern coming for the nozzle. Turbine disc inspection. The inspection for cracks is very important because cracks are not normally allowed. Crack detection, when dealing with the turbine disc and blades, is mostly visual, although structural inspection techniques can be used, such as penetrant methods and others, to aid in the inspection. Cracks on the disc necessitate the rejection of the disc and replacement of the turbine rotor. Slight pitting caused by the impingement of foreign matter may be blended by stoning and polishing. Turbine blade inspection. Turbine blades are usually inspected and cleaned in the same manner as compressor blades. However, because of the extreme heat under which the turbine blades operate, they are more susceptible to damage. Using a strong light and a magnifying glass, inspect the turbine blades for stress rupture cracks and deformation of the leading edge. Figures 1064 and 1065. Stress rupture cracks usually appear as minute hairline cracks on or across the leading or trailing edge at a right angle to the edge length. Visible cracks may range in length from 1 16th inch upward. Deformation, caused by over temperature, may appear as waviness and slasher areas of varying airfoil thickness along the leading edge. The leading edge must be straight and of uniform thickness along its entire length, except for areas repaired by blending. Do not confuse stress rupture cracks or deformation of the leading. Figure 1064. Stress rupture cracks. Edge with foreign material impingement damage, or with blending repairs to the blade. When any stress rupture cracks or deformation of the leading edges of the first stage turbine blades are found, an over temperature condition must be suspected. Check the individual blades for stretch, and the turbine disc for hardness and stretch. Blades removed for a detailed inspection, or for a check of turbine disc stretch must be reinstalled in the same slots from which they were removed. Number the blades prior to removal. The turbine blade outer shroud should be inspected for air seal wear. If shroud wear is found, Measure the thickness of the shroud at the worn area. Use a micrometer or another suitable and accurate measuring device that ensures a good reading in the bottom of the comparatively narrow wear groove. If the remaining radial thickness of the shroud is less than that specified, the stretch blade must be replaced. Typical blade inspection requirements are indicated in Figure 1066. Blade. 1051. Figure 1065. Turbine blade waviness. Tip curling within a one half inch square area on the leading edge of the blade tip is usually acceptable if the curling is not sharp. Curling is acceptable on the trailing edge if it does not extend beyond the allowable area. Any sharp bends that may result in cracking or a piece breaking out of the turbine blade is cause for rejection, even though the curl may be within the allowable limits. Each turbine blade should be inspected for cracks. Turbine blade replacement procedure. Turbine blades are generally replaceable, subject to moment weight limitations. These limitations are contained in the engine manufacturer's applicable technical instructions. If visual inspection of the turbine assembly discloses several broken, cracked, or eroded blades, replacing the entire turbine assembly may be more economical than replacing the damaged blades. Figure 1067. In the initial buildup of the turbine, a complete set of 54. 
Plates made and coded pairs Two plates having the same code letters is laid out on the bench in the order of diminishing moment weight. The code letters, indicating the moment weight balance in ounces, are marked on the rear face of the first three section of the plate viewing the plate as installed at final assembly of the engine. The pair of plates having the heaviest moment weight is numbered 1 and 28. The next heaviest pair of plates is numbered 2 and 29. The third heaviest pair is numbered 3 and 30. This is continued until Nits over 0.008 inch deep are cause for rejection except that, if nits are slightly deeper than 0.006 inch, but do not exceed 0.012 inch in depth, and are well away from the lead, or trail edge the blade is acceptable for continued use. Nits that come through the underside of blade are cause for rejection. Nits on the leading edge must be completely blended out. If too much material must be removed, reject blade. Nits on the convex surface away from the leading, and the trailing edges need not be completely blended out. Same for the concave surface. Nicks a tip edge not critical blend raised edge only. One half. One half. Tip curling permissible in these areas, if under certain circumstances. One fourth. Examine carefully for indication of cracks at edges of vert serrations. Reject for any indication of cracks. Entire trailing edges critical area. Nicks at outer tip end not as critical as nicks nearer the root end, since the nearer the root end, the greater the moment weight tending to produce a crack. Nicks on the trailing edge must be completely removed. Too much material must be removed, reject blade. Figure 1066. Typical turbine blade inspection. 1052. DU51. DU52. DU53. DV54. DK1. DK2. DL3. DU50. DL4. DL5. DU49. DL6. DL7. DT47. DU48. DM8. DM9. DT46. DM10, DT45, DN11, DS44, DN12, DR43, DP13, DR42, DP14, DP41, DR15, DP40, DR16, DN39, DS17, DN38, DT18, DM37, DM36, DT19, DM35, DT20, DL34, DU21, DL33, DU22, DL32, DL31, DU23, DL30, DK29, DK28, DV27, DU26, DU25, DU24, Figure 1067, Typical Turbine Rotor Blade Moment Weight Distribution. All the blades have been numbered. Mark a number 1 on the face of the hub on the turbine disc. The number 1 blade is then installed adjacent to the number 1 on the disc. Figure 1068 The remaining blades are then installed consecutively in a clockwise direction, viewed from the rear face of the turbine disc. If there are several pairs of blades having the same code letters, they are installed consecutively before going. Spherical indent on face of discs clockwise, viewed from rear. Figure 1068 Turbine blades To the next code letters. If a blade requires replacement, the diametrically opposite blade must also be replaced. Computer programs generally determine the location for turbine blades for turbine wheels on modern engines. Turbine nozzle inlet guide vein inspection. After removing the required components, the first stage turbine blades and turbine nozzle veins are accessible for inspection. The blade limits specified in the engine manufacturer's overhaul and service instruction manual should be adhered to. Figure 1069 shows where cracks usually occur on the turbine nozzle assembly. Slight nicks and dents are permissible if the depth of damage is within limits. Inspect the nozzle veins for nicks or cracks. Small nicks are not cause for vein rejection, provided such nicks blend out smoothly. Inspect the nozzle vein supports for defects caused by the impingement of foreign particles. Use a stone to blend any doubtful nicks to a smooth radius. Like turbine blades, it is possible to replace a maximum number of turbine nozzle veins in some engines. If more than the maximum veins are damaged, a new turbine nozzle vein assembly must be installed. With the tailpipe exhaust nozzle removed, the rear turbine stage can be inspected for any cracks or evidence of blade stretch. Additional nozzle stages can also be inspected with a strong light by looking through the rear stage turbine. Clearances. Checking the clearances is one of the procedures in the maintenance of the turbine section of a turbine engine. The manufacturer's service and overhaul manual gives the procedures and tolerances for checking the turbine. Turbine clearances being measured at various locations are shown in figures 1070 and 1071. To obtain accurate readings, special tools provided by each manufacturer must be used as described in the service instructions for specific engines. Exhaust section. The exhaust section of the turbine engine is susceptible to heat cracking. This section must be thoroughly inspected along with the inspection the combustion section and turbine section of the engine. 
inspect the exhaust cone and exhaust nozzle for cracks, warping, buckling, or hot spots. Hot spots on the tail cone are a good indication of a malfunction in fuel nozzle or combustion chamber. The inspection and repair procedures for the hot section of any one gas turbine engine share similarities to those of other gas turbine engines. One usual difference is the nomenclature applied to the various parts of the hot section by the different manufacturers. Other differences include the manner of disassembly, the tooling necessary, and the repair methods and limits. 1053. Turbine nozzle assembly adjunction of combustion chamber outlet duct and turbine nozzle outer case. Turbine nozzle assembly. Cracked area along spot weld line on inner duct. Spot weld cracks on inner duct. Figure 1069. Turbine nozzle assembly defects. 1054. Figure 1070. Measuring the turbine blades to shroud tip clearances. Figure 1071. Measuring turbine wheel to exhaust cone clearance. Engine ratings. The flat rating of a turbine engine is the thrust performance that is guaranteed by the manufacturer for a new engine under specific operating conditions, such as takeoff, maximum continuous climb, and cruise power settings. The turbine inlet temperature is proportional to the energy available to turn the turbine. This means that the hotter the gases are that are entering the turbine section of the engine, the more power is available to turn the turbine wheel. The exhaust temperature is proportional to the turbine inlet temperature. Regardless of how or where the exhaust temperature is taken on the engine for the flight deck reading, this temperature is proportional to the temperature of the exhaust gases entering the first stage of inlet guide vanes. The higher EGT corresponds to a larger amount of energy to the turbine, so it can turn the compressor faster. This works fine until the temperature reaches a point when the turbine inlet guide vanes start to be damaged. EGT must be held constant or lowered as the result of a prolonged hot section life and, at the same time, provide the thrust to meet the certification requirements. Before high bypass turbofan engines, some older types of engines used water injection to increase thrust for takeoff wet. This is the maximum allowable thrust for takeoff. The rating is obtained by actuating the water injection system and setting the computed wet thrust with the throttle in terms of a predetermined turbine discharge pressure or engine pressure ratio for the prevailing ambient conditions. The rating is restricted to takeoff, is time limited, and has an altitude limitation. Water injection is not used very much on turbine engines anymore. Turbine engine instruments. Engine pressure ratio indicator. Engine pressure ratio EPR is an indication of the thrust, being developed by a turbofan engine, and is used to set power for takeoff on many types of aircraft. It is instrumented by total pressure pickups in the engine inlet PT2 and in the turbine exhaust PT7. The reading is displayed in the flight deck by the EPR gauge, which is used in making engine power settings. Figure 1072. 30. 25. 34. Pressure. 20. Ratio. 12. 15. Figure 1072. Engine pressure ratio indications. 1055. Fork meter turboprop engines. Only 10 to 15 percent of the thrust produced by a turboprop engine is from propulsive force derived from the jet thrust exiting the exhaust. Engine pressure ratio is not used as an indicator of the power produced by a turboprop engine. Turboprops are usually fitted with a torque meter that measures torque applied to a shaft turned by the gas generator and power turbines of the turbine engine. The torque meter can be operated by engine oil pressure meter through a valve that is controlled by a helical ring gear that moves in response to the applied torque. Figure 1073 This gear moves against a piston that controls the opening of a valve, which controls the oil pressure flow. This action makes the oil pressure proportional to torque being applied at the propeller shaft. Generally, transducer is used to transfer the oil pressure into an electrical signal to be read by the flight deck instrument. The readout in the flight deck is normally an LP slash FT of torque, or percent horsepower. The torque meter is very important as it is used to set power settings. This instrument must be calibrated at intervals to assure its accuracy. Tachometer. Gas turbine engine speeds are measured by the engine's RPM, which are also the compressor slash turbine combination RPM of each rotating spool. Most turbofan engines have two or more spools, compressor, and turbine sections that turn independently at different speeds. Tachometers are usually calibrated in percent RPM, so that various types of engines can be operated on the same basis of comparison. Figure 1073 also, turbine speeds are generally very high, and the large numbers of RPM would make it very confusing. Turbofan engines with two spools or separate shafts, high pressure and low pressure spools, are generally referred to as N1 and N2, with each having their own indicator. The main purpose of the tachometer is to be able to monitor RPM under normal conditions, during an engine start, and to indicate an overspeed condition, if one occurs. Exhaust Gas Temperature Indicator EGT Exhaust Gas Temperature EGT Turbine Inlet Temperature IT Turbine Gas Temperature TGT Interstage Turbine Temperature IT and Turbine Outlet Temperature TOT are all relative temperatures used to monitor the temperature of the exhaust gases entering the first stage turbine inlet guide vanes. 
Even though these temperatures are taken at different locations on the engine, each engine having one location, they are all relative to the temperature of the gases entering the first stage turbine inlet guide vanes. Temperature is an engine operating limit, and is used to monitor the mechanical integrity of the turbines, as well as to check engine operating conditions. Actually, the temperature of the gases entering the first stage turbine inlet guide vanes is the important consideration, since it is the most critical of all the engine variables. However, it is impractical to measure turbine inlet temperature in most engines, especially large engines. Consequently, temperature thermocouples are inserted at the turbine discharge, where the temperature provides a relative indication of that at the inlet. Although the temperature at this point is much lower than at the inlet, it provides surveillance over the engine's internal operating conditions. Several thermocouples are usually used, and are spaced at intervals around the perimeter of the engine exhaust duct near the turbine exit. The EGT indicator in the flight deck shows the average temperature measured by the individual thermocouples. Figure 1073. Fuel flow indicator. Fuel flow instruments indicate the fuel flow in pounds per hour LP slash HR from the engine fuel control. Fuel flow in turbine aircraft is measured in LP slash HR instead of gallons, because the fuel weight is a major factor in the aerodynamics of large turbine aircraft. Fuel flow is of interest in monitoring fuel consumption and checking engine performance. Figure 1073. Engine oil pressure indicator. The guard against engine failure resulting from inadequate lubrication and cooling of the various engine parts. The oil supply to critical areas must be monitored. The oil pressure indicator usually shows the engine oil pump discharge pressure. Engine oil temperature indicator. The ability of the engine oil to lubricate and cool depends on the temperature of the oil, as well as the amount of oil supplied to the critical areas. An oil inlet temperature indicator frequently is provided to show the temperature of the oil as it enters the oil pressure pump. Oil inlet temperature is also an indication of proper operation of the engine oil cooler. Turbine engine operation. The engine operating procedures presented here apply generally to turbofan, turboprop, turboshaft, and auxiliary power units APU. The procedures, pressures, temperatures, and RPM that follow are intended primarily to serve as a guide. It should be understood that they do not have general application. The manufacturer's operating instructions should be consulted before attempting to start and operate any turbine engine. A turbofan engine has only one power control lever. Adjusting the power lever or throttle lever sets up a thrust condition for which the fuel control meters fuel to the engine. Engines equipped with thrust reversers go into reverse thrust. 1056. 50, 100, 12, 0, 0, side torque meter, 150, 0, 200, 9, 9, 7, 7, fuel flow, 1, 1, 5, 5, 3, 3, 2, 2, 0, 10, 0, 40, 60, oil press, 80, 100, 80, 90, percent RPM, 20, 30, 40, 50, side, 60, 70, 20, 0, 100, 0, 9, 10, 8, 9, 8, 7, 7, X gas temp, 0, 50, degree C, 6, 0, 5, 4, 3, 2, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 50, 5, 4, 100, 150, oil, figure 1073, typical turbine engine instruments, 1057, Throttle positions below idle. A separate fuel shutoff lever is usually provided on engines equipped with thrust reversers. Prior to start, particular attention should be paid to the engine air inlet, the visual condition and free movement of the compressor and turbine assembly, and the parking ramp area fore and aft of the aircraft. The engine is started by using an external air power source, APU comma an already operating engine. Starter types and the engine starting cycle have been discussed previously. On multi-engine aircraft, the engines are usually started by an onboard APU that supplies the air pressure for a pneumatic starter on each engine. Air bled from the APU is used as a source of power for starting the engines. During the start, it is necessary to monitor the tachometer, the oil pressure, and the exhaust gas temperature. The normal starting sequence is 1. Rotate the compressor with the starter. 2. Turn the ignition on. And 3. Open the engine fuel valve, either by moving the throttle to idle, or by moving the fuel shutoff lever or turning a switch. Adherence to the procedure prescribed for a particular engine is necessary as a safety measure, and to avoid a hot or hung start. A successful start is noted first by a rise in exhaust gas temperature. If the engine does not light up, meaning that fuel starts to burn inside of the engine within a prescribed period of time, or if the exhaust gas starting temperature limit is exceeded, a hot start, the starting procedure should be aborted. Hot starts are not common, but when they do occur, they can usually be stopped in time to avoid excessive temperature by observing the exhaust gas temperature constantly during the start. 
when necessary. The engine is cleared of trapped fuel or gases. I continue to rotate the compressor with the starter, but with the ignition, and fuel turns off. If the engine did not light off during start after the allotted time, about 10 seconds, although this time varies from engine to engine, the fuel must be shut off as the engine is being filled with unburned fuel. The hunt start is when the engine lights off, but the engine will not accelerate to idle RPM. Ground operation engine fire. Move the fuel shutoff lever to the off position if an engine fire occurs, or if the fire warning light is illuminated during the starting cycle. Continue cranking or motoring the engine until the fire has been expelled from the engine. If the fire persists, O2 can be discharged into the inlet duct while it is being cranked. Do not discharge O2 directly into the engine exhaust because it may damage the engine. If the fire cannot be extinguished, secure all switches and leave the aircraft. If the fire is on the ground under the engine overboard drain, discharge the CO2 on the ground rather than on the engine. This also is true if the fire is at the tailpipe and the fuel is dripping to the ground and burning. Engine checks. Checking turbofan engines for proper operation consists primarily of simply reading the engine instruments and then comparing the observed values with those known to be correct for any given engine operating condition. After the engine has started, idle RPM has been attained, and the instrument readings have stabilized, the engine should be checked for satisfactory operation at idling speed. The oil pressure indicator, tachometer, and the exhaust gas temperature readings should be compared with the allowable ranges. Checking takeoff thrust. Takeoff thrust is checked by adjusting the throttle to obtain a single, predicted reading on the engine pressure ratio indicator in the aircraft. The value for engine pressure ratio, which represents takeoff thrust for the prevailing ambient atmospheric conditions, is calculated from a takeoff thrust setting curve or, on newer aircraft, is a function of the onboard computer. This curve has been computed for static conditions. Figure 1074 Therefore, for all precise thrust checking, the aircraft should be stationary, and stable engine operation should be established. If it is needed for calculating thrust during an engine trim check, turbine discharge pressure PT7 is also shown on these curves. Appropriate manuals should be consulted for the charts for a specific make and model engine. Engine trimming procedure is also covered in Chapter 3, Engine Fuel and Fuel Metering Systems. The engine pressure ratio computed from the thrust setting curve represents thrust, or a lower thrust called part power thrust used for testing. The aircraft throttle is advanced to obtain this predicted reading on the engine pressure ratio indicator, or the part power stop is engaged in the aircraft. If an engine develops the predicted thrust, and if all the other engine instruments are reading within their proper ranges, engine operation is considered satisfactory. Full authority digital engine controls, FATIC engine controls, computer controls also have means of checking the engine with the results displayed on the flight deck. Ambient conditions. The sensitivity of gas turbine engines to compressor inlet air temperature and pressure necessitates that considerable care be taken to obtain correct values for the prevailing ambient air conditions when computing takeoff thrust. Some things to remember are 1. The engine senses the air temperature and pressure at the compressor inlet. This is the actual air temperature just above the runway surface. When the aircraft is stationary, the pressure at the compressor inlet is 1058. Field barometric pressure Hg. Ambient temperature degree C. 40 20 0 plus 20 plus 40. 26.00. 27.00. 28.00. 29.00. 30.00. 30 31.00. 24.00, A. Burner pressure limit. B. Interpolate to locate these points. Example. Ambient temperature equals 20 degrees C. Field barometric pressure equals 30.50 Hg. Adjust throttle to obtain EPR determined at point A or the R7. Valve determined at point B. Engine pressure ratio P7 slash P2. Turbine discharge pressure P7 in HG. Figure 1074. Typical takeoff thrust setting curve for static conditions. The static field or true barometric pressure, and not the barometric pressure corrected to sea level that is normally reported by airport control towers as the altimeter setting. On static engines, the computer reads this information and sends it to the engine controls. 2. Temperature sensed is the total air temperature tab that is used by several onboard computers. The engine controls set the engine computers according to the TAT. 3. Relative humidity, which affects reciprocating engine power appreciably, has a negligible effect on turbine engine thrust, fuel flow, and RPM. Therefore, relative humidity is not usually considered when computing thrust for takeoff, or determining fuel flow and RPM for routine operation. Engine shutdown. On turbine engines, the tab of thrust reverser, retarding the aircraft throttle to idle, or power lever to off cuts the fuel supply to the engine, and shuts down the engine. On engines equipped with thrust reversers, this is accomplished by means of a separate fuel shutoff lever or switch. When an engine has been operated at high power levels for extended 
periods of time, a cool down time, should be allowed before shutting down. It is recommended the engine be operated at below a low power setting, preferably at idle for a period of 5 minutes to prevent possible seizure of the rotors. This applies, in particular, the prolonged operation at high RPM on the ground, such as during engine trimming. The turbine case and the turbine wheels operate at approximately the same temperature when the engine is running. However, the turbine wheels are relatively massive, compared with the case, and are not cooled so readily. The turbine case is exposed to cooling air from both inside and outside the engine. Consequently, the case and the wheels lose their residual heat at different rates after the engine has been shut down. The case, cooling faster, tends to shrink upon the wheels that are still rotating. Under extreme conditions, the turbine blades may squeal or seize. Thus, a cooling period is required if the engine has been operating at prolonged high speed. Should the turbine wheel seize, no harm normally results, provided no attempt is made to turn the engine over until it has cooled sufficiently to free the wheels. In spite of this, every effort should be made to avoid seizure. To ensure that fuel remains in the lines, and that the engine-driven fuel pumps are not starved for fuel that lubricates the pumps, the aircraft fuel boost pump must be turned off after 10.59. Not before, the throttle or the fuel shut-off lever is placed in the off position. Generally, an engine should not be shut down by the fuel shut-off lever until after the aircraft throttle has been retarded to idle. Because the fuel shut-off valve is located on the fuel control discharge, a shutdown from high thrust settings results in high fuel pressures within the control that can harm the fuel system parts. When an accurate reading of the oil level in the oil tank is needed following an engine shutdown, the engine should be operated and shut down with the oil check taking place within not more than 30 minutes after shutdown. Check the engine manuals for the specific procedure. Troubleshooting turbine engines. Included in this section are typical guidelines for locating engine malfunctions on most turbine engines. Since it would be impractical to list all the malfunctions that could occur, only the most common malfunctions are covered. A thorough knowledge of the engine systems, applied with logical reasoning, solves most problems that may occur. Figure 1075 enumerates some malfunctions that may be encountered. Possible causes and suggested actions are given in the adjacent columns. The malfunctions presented herein are solely for the purpose of illustration and should not be construed to have general application. For exact information about a specific engine model, consult the applicable manufacturer's instructions. Turboprop operation. Turboprop engine operation is quite similar to that of a turbojet engine, except for the added feature of a propeller. The starting procedure and the various operational features are very much alike. The turboprop chiefly requires attention to engine operating limits, the throttle or power lever setting, and the torque meter pressure gauge. Although torque meters indicate only the power being supplied to the propeller and not the equivalent shaft horsepower, torque meter pressure is approximately proportional to the total power output and, thus, is used as a measure of engine performance. The torque meter pressure gauge reading during the takeoff engine check is an important value. It is usually necessary to compute the takeoff power in the same manner as is done for a turbojet engine. This computation is to determine the maximum allowable exhaust gas temperature and the torque meter pressure that a normally functioning engine should produce for the outside, or ambient, air temperature and barometric pressure prevailing at the time. Troubleshooting procedures for turboprop engines. All test run-ups, inspections, and troubleshooting should be performed in accordance with the applicable engine manufacturer's instructions. In Figure 1076, the troubleshooting procedure for the turboprop reduction gear, torque meter, and power section are combined because of their interrelationships. The table includes the principal troubles, together with their probable causes and remedies. Turbine engine calibration and testing. Some of the most important factors affecting turbine engine life are EGT, engine cycles. A cycle is generally a takeoff and landing and engine speed. Excess EGT of a few degrees reduces turbine component life. Low EGT materially reduces turbine engine efficiency and thrust. So, to make the engine highly efficient, the exhaust temperatures need to be as high as possible, while maintaining an EGT operating temperature that does not damage the turbine section of the engine. If the engine is operated at excess exhaust temperatures, engine deterioration occurs. Since the EGT temperature is set by the EGT temperature gauge, it is imperative that it is accurate. Excessive engine speed can cause premature engine wear and, if extreme, can cause engine failure. One older type of calibration test unit used to analyze the turbine engine is the Jetzel Analyzer. Figure 1077 The Jetzel Analyzer is a portable instrument made of aluminum, stainless steel, and plastic. The major components of the analyzer are the thermocouple, RPM, EGT indicator, resistance, and insulation check circuits, as well as the potential meter, temperature regulators, meters, switches, and all the necessary cables, ropes, and adapters for performing all tests. Turbine engine analyzer uses Many different types of analyzers are used each with its own function, including onboard systems that use computers to test aircraft systems. 
depending upon the specific analyzer used. Procedures vary somewhat, but the basic tests are outlined here. Always refer to the specific instructions associated with the analyzer being used. Most analyzers may be used to 1. Functionally check the aircraft EGT system for error, without running the engine or disconnecting the wiring. 2. Check individual thermocouples before placement in a parallel harness. 3. Check each engine thermocouple in a parallel harness for continuity. And 60. Indicated malfunction probable causes suggested action. Engine has low RPM, exhaust gas temperature, and fuel flow when set to expected engine pressure ratio. Engine has high RPM, exhaust gas temperature, and fuel flow when set to expect engine pressure ration. Engine has high exhaust gas temperature, low RPM, and high fuel flow in all engine pressure ratio settings. Note, engines with damage in turbine section may have tendency to hang up during starting. Engine vibrates throughout RPM range, but indicated amplitude reduces as RPM is reduced. Engine vibrates at high RPM and fuel flow when compared to constant engine pressure ratio. Engine vibrates throughout RPM range, but is more pronounced in cruise or idle RPM range. No change in power setting parameters, but oil temperature high. Engine has higher than normal exhaust gas temperature during takeoff, climb, and cruise. RPM and fuel flow higher than normal. Engine has high exhaust gas temperature at target engine pressure ratio for takeoff. Engine pressure ratio indication has high reading error. Engine pressure ratio indication has low reading error due to the cylinder crack turbine discharge probe. Deacon turbine discharge pressure line from probe to transmitter. Inaccurate engine pressure ratio transmitter or indicator. Carbon particles collected in turbine discharge pressure line or restrictor orifices. Possible turbine damage and slasher loss of turbine efficiency. If only exhaust gas temperature is high, other parameters normal, the problem may be thermocouple leads or instrument. Turbine damage. Damage in compressor section. Engine mounted accessories such as constant speed drive, generator, hydraulic pump, egg. Engine main bearings. Engine lead air valve malfunction. Turbine discharge pressure probe or line to transmitter leaking. Engine out of trim. Check inlet pressure line from probe to transmitter for leaks. Check engine pressure ratio transmitter and indicator for accuracy. Check probe condition. Pressure test turbine discharge pressure line for leaks. Check engine pressure ratio transmitter and indicator for accuracy. Confirm indication of turbine damage by checking engine coast down for abnormal noise and reduced time. Visually inspect turbine area with strong light. Recalibrate exhaust gas temperature instrumentation. Check turbine as outlined in preceding item. Check compressor section for damage. Check each component in turn. Check scavenge oil filters and magnetic plugs. Check operation of bleed valve. Check condition of probe and pressure line to transmitter. Check engine with jetsail. Three trim as desired. Figure 1075. Troubleshooting turbojet engines. 1061. Indicated malfunction probable causes suggested action. Engine rumbles during starting and at low power cruise conditions. Engine RPM hangs up during starting. High oil temperature. High oil consumption. Overboard oil loss. Pressurizing and drain valve malfunction. Cracked air duct. Fuel control malfunction. Sub-zero ambient temperatures. Compressor section damage. Turbine section damage. Scavenge pump failure. Fuel heater malfunction. Scavenge pump failure. High sump pressure. Gearbox seal leakage. Can be caused by high airflow through the tank, foaming oil, or unusual amounts of oil returned to the tank through the vent system. Replace pressurizing and drain valves. Repair or replace duct. Replace fuel control. If hang up is due to low ambient temperature, engine usually can be started by turning on fuel booster pump or by positioning start lever to run earlier in the starting cycle. Check compressor for damage. Inspect turbine for damage. Check lubricating system and scavenge pumps. Replace fuel heater. Check scavenge pumps. Check sump pressure as outlined in manufacturer's maintenance manual. Check gearbox seal by pressurizing overboard vent. Check oil for foaming. Vacuum check sumps. Check scavenge pumps. Figure 1075. Troubleshooting turbojet engines continued. 4. Check the thermocouples and parallel harness for accuracy. 5. Check the resistance of the EGT circuit. 6. Check the insulation of the EGT circuit for shorts to ground, or for shorts between leads. 7. Check EGT indicators comma either in or out of the aircraft, for error. 8. Determine engine RPM accuracy during engine testing. Added to this is the checking and troubleshooting of the aircraft tachometer system. 9. Establish the proper relationship between the EGT and engine RPM during engine run-up. Analyzer safety precautions. Observe the following safety precautions while operating the engine analyzer or other types of test equipment. 1. Never use a voltmeter to check the potential meter for continuity. If a voltmeter is used, damage to the galvanometer and standard battery cell results. 2. 
Check the thermocouple harness before engine run up. This must be done, because the circuit must be correct before the thermocouples can be used for true EGT pickup. 3. For safety, ground the Jetzel analyzer when using an AC power supply. Any electrical equipment operated on AC power and utilizing wire wound coils, such as the probes with the Jetzel analyzer, has an induced voltage on the case that can be discharged if the equipment is not grounded. This condition is not apparent during dry weather, but on damp days the operator can be shocked slightly. Therefore, for the operator's protection, the Jetzel analyzer should be grounded using the pigtail lead and the power inlet cable. 4. Use heater probes designed for use on the engine thermocouples to be tested. Temperature gradients are very critical in the design of heater probes. Each type of aircraft thermocouple has its own specially designed probe. Never attempt to modify heater probes to test other types of thermocouples. 5. Do not leave heater probe assemblies in the exhaust nozzle during engine run-up. 6. Never allow the heater probes to go over 900 degrees C 1652 degrees F. Exceeding these temperatures results in damage to the Jetzel analyzer and heater probe assemblies. 1062. Trouble probable causes remedy. Power unit fails to turn over during attempted start. Power unit fails to start. Engine fires, but will not accelerate the correct speed. Acceleration temperature too high during starting. Acceleration temperature during starting too low. Engine speed cycles after start. Power unit oil pressure drops off severely. Oil leakage at accessory drive seals. Engine unable to reach maximum controlled speed of 100%. Vibration indication high. No air to starter. Propeller brake locked. Starter speed low because of inadequate air supply to starter. If fuel is not observed leaving the exhaust pipe during start, fuel selector valve may be inoperative because of low power supply or may be locked in off. Fuel pump inoperative. Aircraft fuel filter dirty. Fuel control cutoff valve closed. Insufficient fuel supply to control unit. Fuel control main meter in valve sticking. Fuel control bypass valve sticking open. Drain valve stuck open. Starting fuel enrichment pressure switch setting too high. Fuel control bypass valve sticking closed. Fuel control acceleration cam incorrectly adjusted. Defective fuel nozzle. Fuel control thermostat failure. Acceleration cam of fuel control incorrectly adjusted. Unstable fuel control governor operation. Oil supply low. Oil pressure transmitter or indicator giving false indication. Seal failure. Faulty propeller governor. Faulty fuel controller air sensing tip. Vibration pickup or vibration meter malfunction. Check started air valve solenoid and air supply. Unlock brake by turning propeller by hand in direction of normal rotation. Check starter air valve solenoid and air supply. Check power supply or electrically operated valves. Replace valves if defective. Check pump for shear drives or internal damage. Check for air leaks at outlet. Clean filter and replace filtering elements if necessary. Check electrical circuit to ensure that actuator is being energized. Replace actuator or control. Check fuel system to ensure all valves are open and pumps are operative. Flush system. Replace control. Flush system. Replace control. Replace drain valve. Replace pressure switch. Flush system. Replace control. Replace control. Replace nozzle with a known satisfactory unit. Replace control. Replace control. Continue engine operation to allow control to condition itself. Check oil supply and refill as necessary. Check transmitter or indicator and repair or replace if necessary. Replace seal or seals. Replace propeller control assembly. Replace faulty control. If dirty, use air pressure in reverse direction of normal flow through internal engine passage and sensing tip. Calibrate vibration meter. Start engine and increase power gradually. Observe vibration indicator. If indications prove pickup to be at fault, replace it. If high vibration remains as originally observed, remove power unit for overhaul. Figure 1076. Troubleshooting turboprop engines. 1063. EGT indicator selector switch SW4 EGT indicator adjusting rheostat. Selector switch SW1. Temperature regulator. Tachometer EGT indicator check input receptacle P3. RPM check tachyl unit. RPM check. Calvo 2. 50. 40 60. 30 70. 20 80. Mech 0 Mech 0. Off range. RPM. Selector switch. EGT T slash C res. Off insole. Temperature regulator. 1090. Resistance check selector switch. Resistance insulation check input receptacle P2. EGT in check. Input. E3. RPM SW4. R1. Insulation check meter. ADJ Rio. SW1. 0 100. Temp regulator. Potential meter insulation check. Galvo 3. Resistance check. E3. Reg insole. SW3. Thermocouple check. S1 S2. Heater cable check cable. Mech 0. 
Mech Zero. Range Elix Zerg. SW9. Battery Operation. R-3 R-10. R-1. Lex Zero. R-100. R-1000. 110 V6400. Power Input Receptacle P1. 2 Amp 20 Amp. R-2. SW9. Heater Cable Receptacle S1. Jet Cable Receptacle S2. Fuses. Heater Cable Switch SW2. Potential Meter Insulation Jet Meter Operating Knob. Figure 1077. Jetzel Analyzer Instrument Compartment. Continuity Check of Aircraft DGT Circuit. To eliminate any error caused by one or more inoperative aircraft thermocouples, a continuity check is performed. The check is made by heating one heater probe to between 500 and 700 degrees C and placing the hot probe over each of the aircraft thermocouples, one at a time. The EGT indicator must show a temperature rise as each thermocouple is checked. When large numbers eight or more of thermocouples are used in the harness, it is difficult to see a rise on the aircraft instrument because of the electrical characteristics of a parallel circuit. Therefore, the temperature indication of the aircraft thermocouples is read on the potential meter of the analyzer by using the check cable and necessary adapter. Functional check of aircraft EGT circuit. During the EGT system functional test and the thermocouple harness checks, the analyzer has a specific degree of accuracy at the test temperature, which is usually the maximum operating temperature of the turbine engine. Figure 1070 at each engine has its own maximum operating temperature, and can be found in applicable technical instructions. The test is made, by heating the engine thermocouples in the exhaust nozzle or turbine section to the engine test temperature. The heat is supplied by heater probes through, the necessary cables. With the engine thermocouples hot, their temperature is registered on the aircraft EGT indicator. At the same time, the thermocouples embedded in the heater probes, which are completely isolated from the aircraft system, are picking up and registering the same temperature on the test analyzer. The temperature registered on the aircraft EGT indicator should be within the specified tolerance of the aircraft system. Figure 1078. EGT analyzer. 1064. And the temperature reading on the temperature analyzer. When the temperature difference exceeds the allowable tolerance, troubleshoot the aircraft system. EGT indicator check. The EGT indicator is tested after being removed from the aircraft instrument panel and disconnected from the aircraft EGT circuit leads. Attach the instrument cable and EGT indicator adapter leads to the indicator terminals and place the indicator in its normal operating position. Adjust the analyzer switches to the proper settings. The indicator reading should correspond to the readings of the analyzer within the allowable limits of the EGT indicator. Correction for ambient temperature is not required for this test, as both the EGT indicator and analyzer are temperature compensated. The temperature registered on the aircraft EGT indicator should be within the specified tolerance of the aircraft system, and the temperature reading on the analyzer readout. When the temperature difference exceeds the allowable tolerance, troubleshoot the aircraft system. Resistance and insulation check. The thermocouple harness continuity is checked, while the EGT system is being checked functionally. The resistance of the thermocouple harness is held to very close tolerances, since a change in resistance changes the amount of current flow in the circuit. A change of resistance gives erroneous temperature readings. The resistance and insulation check circuits make it possible to analyze and isolate any error in the aircraft system. How the resistance and insulation circuits are used is discussed with troubleshooting procedures. Tachometer check. To read engine speed with an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1% during engine run, the frequency of the tachometer generator older style is measured by the RPM check analyzer. The scale of the RPM check circuit is calibrated in percent RPM to correspond to the aircraft tachometer indicator, which also reads in percent RPM. The aircraft tachometer and the RPM check circuit are connected in parallel, and both are indicating during engine run-up. The RPM check circuit readings can be compared with the readings of the aircraft tachometer to determine the accuracy of the aircraft instrument. Many newer engines use a magnetic pickup that counts passing gear teeth edges, which are seen electrically as pulses of electrical power as they pass by the pickup. Figure 1079, by counting the amount of pulses, the RPM of the shaft is obtained. This type of system requires little maintenance, other than setting the clearance between the gear teeth and the magnetic pickup. Figure 1079, magnetic pickup and gear, troubleshooting EGT system. An appropriate analyzer is used to test and troubleshoot the aircraft thermocouple system at the first indication of trouble or during periodic maintenance checks. The test circuits of the analyzer make it possible to isolate the troubles listed below. Following the list is a discussion of each trouble mentioned. 1. One or more inoperative thermocouples in engine parallel harness 2. Engine thermocouples out of calibration 3. EGT indicator error 4. Resistance of circuit out of tolerance 5. Shorts to ground 6. Shorts between leads. One or more inoperative thermocouples in engine parallel harness. 
This error is found in the regular testing of aircraft thermocouples with a hot heater probe, and is a broken lead wire in the parallel harness, or a short of ground in the harness. In the latter case, the current from the grounded thermocouple can leak off and never be shown on the indicator. However, this grounded condition can be found by using the insulation resistance check. Engine thermocouples out of calibration. When thermocouples are subjected for a period of time to oxidizing atmospheres, such as encountered in turbine engines, they drift appreciably from their original calibration. On engine parallel harnesses, when individual thermocouples can be removed, these thermocouples can be bench checked using one heater probe. The temperature reading obtained from the thermocouples should be within manufacturer's tolerances. 1065. EGT circuit error. This error is found by using the EGT and comparing the reading of the aircraft EGT indicator with the analyzer temperature reading. Figure 1078 the analyzer and aircraft temperature readings are then compared. Resistance of circuit out of tolerance. The engine thermocouple circuit resistance is a very important adjustment since a high resistance condition gives a low indication on the aircraft EGT indicator. This condition is dangerous because the engine is operating with excess temperature, but the high resistance makes the indicator red low. It is important to check and correct this condition. Shorts the ground, slash shorts between leads. These errors are found by doing the insulation check using an ohmmeter. Resistance values from 0 to 550,000 ohms can be read on the insulation check ohmmeter by selecting the proper range. Troubleshooting aircraft tachometer system. A function of the RPM check is troubleshooting the aircraft tachometer system. The RPM check circuit in the analyzer is used to read engine speed during engine run-up with an accuracy of plus or minus 0.1%. The connections for the RPM check are the instrument cable and aircraft tachometer system lead to the tachometer indicator. After the connections have been made between the analyzer RPM check circuit and the aircraft tachometer circuit, the two circuits, now classed as one, are a parallel circuit. The engine is then run up as prescribed and applicable technical instructions. Both systems can be read simultaneously. If the difference between the readings of the aircraft tachometer indicator and the analyzer RPM check circuit exceeds the tolerance prescribed in applicable technical instructions, the engine must be stopped and the trouble located and corrected. 1066. Chapter 11. Light Sport Aircraft Engines.